morning, everybody. This is Ryan Cunningham, Madam Self Desk Manager. Uh, please type in a question if you we're having audio problems or if there's any problems with connectivity. Uh, just type in something in the question and let us know. Uh, today with me, I am joined by uh, Trevor Burns, who's our Student Enrollment Coordinator. Hello, everyone. Okay, so the f first thing we're going to do is I'm going to have Trevor, he's working on sharing his screen right now. Okay, there we go. So this is the uh, main dog page. So he's going to take us to the help desk page. And we're going to go over some self-service resources uh, in regards to truancy. So if you go down to the Synergy Instructions tile, which is your first resource tile, we have a job aid for not only truancy manual entry, which is below the Synergy manual entry, but also further down we have um, job aids for student uh, truancy uploads. So an upload gu uh, guide, sample file, data dictionary, um, so if we go up, can you go back up, Trevor, and click on the truancy manual entry guide? So I believe this is about a 10, 11 page, 12 page document. If you go to the very last page, at the bottom of the very last page, there is a link to our truancy page. Can you hit that link? So this talks about you know what constitutes truancy and it, it points to statute for everybody um, if you need that as a resource. So there are five things. This is sort of like what's going on, what's new, an update for truancy. Um, now we are seven days removed from the Q2 truancy um, certification deadline. Uh, one thing that you may have noticed that was not present in Q2 was um, the term please verify attendance and enter truancy if needed. Again, we can't validate on age, so if a student starts um, school, they start their truancy at, at age 16, but at some point they hit 17, they're no longer of compulsory age, and so that truancy should be ended. And that's the only time you should ever end a truancy um, in mid-year, is if they age out of compulsory age. Um, that was not present in Q2. It will be back for Q3, as well as for Q3, we're adding um, to the attendance certification report, there will be a truancy note col column that will have one of three values. It'll either be blank, in other words, a student is not truant, nor do they have an amount of unexcused absences that would warrant them to be considered truant. Why? Um, if the student has a truancy uh, and a number of absences has been uh, entered, that would constitute a truancy, and then know if they have an amount of unexcused absences that would constitute a truancy, but there is no truancy present for that student. So we feel that that's going to be very helpful for you to go through and validate. So basically, you just want to get rid of the ends and you want to make sure that the whys should be wise and that you have truly do have correct truancy information for them. Uh, we have a question. Go ahead with that, Trevor. Uh, the question is, can you upload an end? Can you upload an end? Like, um, are you saying like an end date or um, like an end date for the truth? No, no. You can all, that can only be done manually. So again, the only time that you should close a truancy deliberately mid-year is if the student turns 17, and that can only be done through manual entry. So um, moving on, uh, uh, students should only have one truancy record per district enrollment. If they exit and return later in the, in the year, they can have multiple. Uh, districts cannot reopen a, clu a closed truancy, but only the help desk can delete an entry. So if you've put, uh, let's say you put in a truancy, the student hits the number of consecutive accumulative days, um, but then two weeks later on, the parents come in with a doctor note and say, you know, 
basically turning these unexcused absences into excused absences, then contact the help desk. Uh, we may ask for a little bit of insight into the particular situation, but that is the only way that you're going to be able to delete uh, a truancy is if, if you go through the help desk and have them do it. Um, so again, if a student exits your district and they were truant and they go to District B and then come back to A and they uh, continue to get on excuse absences, then you cannot re that's not a reopen of a truancy, that's a subsequent truancy incident and will need to be answered in as such. Um, we have another question. Uh, does the DOE distinguish between excused and unexcused absences? Because we have students that don't meet the threshold for truancy, but they do have a Y for chronically absent. Do they need truancy? So chronic absenteeism um, is just tracking the student's attendance overall. So that will also look at excused and unexcused absences just to see how, how much the student is in class. Whereas truancy, um, these are only looking at unexcused absences. It's the kid's missing. We don't know where he's going. He's not coming to the classroom. So um, you can have kids who are chronically absent who are not truant. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, so moving on, uh, truancy days on the certification report will total all days on excused for the whole school year, not just the quarter. So where a lot of our quarterly reporting is just looking at that 90-day window, um, the truancy days on the certification report will reflect cumulative days on excuse for the entire school year for that enrollment in that district for that student. Um, uh, we recently updated the verbiage on truancy types and synergy and the data reporting page to better align with statute. The ones in synergy and the data dictionary are slightly abbreviated to, to fit in the drop downs, but they are the same thing. And please note that this has no effect on your local SISs. They are simply going off the truancy type codes, 01 through 06. Those codes have remained the same. So you will see a slight deviation between what the description for those codes are in the truancy type dropdown on the Synergy UI versus what you'll see in our guidance. Our guidance is a little bit more uh, you know, extensive in the explanation uh, where we really had to kind of file that down for the drop down purposes. Um, you got something, Durham? We had a question. Uh, and what if, so I believe you actually mentioned this. Um, what if a student is identified as truant but documentation is provided weeks later, excusing the absences and is no longer considered truant? Um, I believe Ryan mentioned you contact the help desk at that point um, and you had mentioned the students. Uh, unexcused absences are now excused, and we can go about uh, either ending or removing that truancy. Correct. And there are some validations that the help desk is going to run on that, um, simply due to the fact that uh, if, if a student has 20 cumulative days, and then after that fact, it comes back and six of those have now been excused, we're not going to delete that truancy because that student is still above the benchmark to be considered truant. Um, it's only if the, the, the acceptance of what was on excused days to be excused days drops them below the benchmark that we will actually delete that uh, truancy incident. Um, so the last thing that's kind of what's new, what's going on right now is um, there is no pause or resume, uh, open the truancy when it hits the marker, then no steps throughout the year. As you do them, truancies auto close when exited, uh, when exiting the student out of district or end of the year. That's the only time that truancies are going to close, um, and that will be done automatically. The only time that um, you should be deliberately ending truancy is if the student turns 17 and is no longer of compulsory age. So we do not have the ability to do that programmatically to say, okay, well, student A. Uh, hit 17 on, on January 1st, so we're automatically going to close the truancy incident. We don't have that capability programmatically, so that's where you're going to have to go in. And again, that has to be done manually. That cannot be done through an upload. So also with us today, with me and Trevor today, is Kathy Warren. She is the Data Management Systems Manager. We are hoping to have Gail Ernheim, who is our 
statewide TVAE coordinator. For those of you who do not know, that stands for Truancy Dropout and Alternative Education. Um, she is basically our truancy expert. We are hoping to have this as a Q&A more geared to for her to answer that. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna go check again to see if she's back. But absolutely feel free to uh, ask questions, even if we the three of us here don't have the capacity, being that we're not subject specialists to answer those questions. We will mark them down. We will get an answer for them. We will put them on a Q and A. Um, we are getting better at, at getting these webinars um, recorded and transcribed and getting uh, posted on the website. In fact, there was um, an attendance common issues uh, that we just got posted up today. It's the quickest turnaround we've had uh, for actually posting a webinar, and we are looking to get it down to, I, I would like to get it down to three days, three business days, um, but we've got a little bit more work to do and we are getting better at it. Um, so at that, with that being said, um, feel free to type in questions. We're hoping to get, um, we're hoping to get Gail in here shortly, um, but Trevor, if you want to go ahead with questions, we'll do our best to answer them. First question, just one clear, 17-year-olds do not count as truant, and we do not have to create truancy events for them. That is correct. Once a kid hits 17 years old, they are no longer of compulsory age. If they have an, uh, an ongoing truancy incident, go in and manually end it. Um, or if they start accumulating on excused days, after their 17th birthday, those cannot be taken into consideration for opening a new truancy incident. Okay, so we have a, a pretty long question here. Um, so in the past, uh, you've asked us to pause the truancy if the student returns to school. So if a student is in our district, becomes truant, our efforts to get them back in school work, they attend for a month, but then they fell truant again, and we work out how to get them back again. How do we record that? That's the first question. So if, if the truancy, the truancy doesn't end unless they hit 17. So a truancy, even if they, now in that example, Trevor, can you remind me, did they remain in the same district throughout, or did they go to another district and come back? So the only times the truancy will end on a student is if they leave the district, and or if it gets to the end of the year and they followed all the steps they needed to by right. the end of the year. But it's, I think that question, what they were saying was, the kid hits truancy but then comes back and is keeping good attendance. He would still and, have that truancy incident. Right, that truancy just stays open for that time frame where they are coming to school and and um, you can kind of, kind of just stay on the last step because you're not gonna continue with truancy steps if they're attending school on a regular basis. And if they keep going, fine, it'll end the end of year, or if they move out of district. Yeah, and we, we, expect the, we expect to see truancies go out to the end of the year unless the student leaves your district. So even if your student comes back and is attending classes, that truancy incident will still be in place. If you took all the steps and you got them back in school, you won't need to put in a new truancy incident next year. However, if say you did miss a step, and the student still didn't come back, you would put in a truancy incident in the following school year and enroll the student. But if you follow those steps and they just don't, uh, they're either coming now or they have left, you would then just not enroll them the next year. Um, the next part of that question. Yeah. Um, so my apologies, I just discovered Jim got called by the Education Committee this morning um, and the legislature takes priority over our webinar. So she is downstairs testifying with the Ed Committee. Um, so if any people have questions uh, that we can't answer, please ask them anyway and we'll collect them and get her answers to them and publish them with the um, webinar transcript. Thanks for that, Kathy. You're welcome. Um, so the next part of that question was um, in the past, oh, no, in the continuation to how they record that. Oh, question disappeared on me. Okay, there it is. Um, how do we record that? In the past, we would have entered the date the student first became truant. That's correct. Pause it when they returned and then resume the truancy when they were absent again. When they 
When they returned the second time, we can't pause more than once, so we would have ended the truancy record. It sounds like you don't want this information reported to you. Just open the truancy record once and leave it there. We just record um, until the end of the year or they turn 17. We just record that information locally so that we have accurate attendance information on our end. Is that correct? That is correct. Yep. We just, um, we're not looking at two specifics for truancy. We just need the number of truancy incidents, who's truant, um, and things like that. But we don't need um, the day you the student came back, the day the student left again. We just see that they were true in this school year for this district. Um, we have quite a bit more questions coming in. Um, when a student has an IEP and has met the threshold for truancy, does the truancy meeting and the manifestation meeting have to be separate meetings? Uh, that's one that we're going to type down. We're going to go ahead and present that to Gail and have her um, give that answer on the Q&A document. If it's more timely, if you need that answer answered in a more timely fashion, strongly urge you to contact uh, Gail Arnheim. And I can give you, I will provide you with Gail's contact information. Her email address is gail, G-A-Y-L-E dot Erdheim, E-R-D-H-E-I-M at main spelled out dot gov. And her direct contact line here at state is 624-6637. Next question, if a child is over the age of 17 and still in the school, does that mean we don't have to record them as truant? I, uh, I guess I misunderstood the whole 17 year age to end of year truant school. So uh, students are no longer a compulsory age once they hit 17, so they are no longer covered under truancy law. So no, you do not have to record uh, truancy after they've turned 17 years old. You do still, however, have to record absences because we still need to know that for federal chronic absentee reporting. Okay. Uh, can you define chronic absenteeism versus truancy? Um, truant, based on the definitions we showed you in that document, it's uh, students who miss a certain amount of days in a row or a certain number of days that are unexcused. Um, within a school year for a district, whereas chronic absenteeism is students who happen to miss 10% of their overall days at school, regardless if they're excused or unexcused. There is one exception to that. So it, it's 10% or more, uh, regardless of whether that uh, those absences are excused or unexcused, um, except for if the student has been enrolled for 10 days or less, or if they're in uh, pre-K, in a 4YO program. Insurance carries legal obligations, whereas chronic absenteeism does not. Right. Chronic absenteeism is just a reporting marker. So if you go back to that uh, truancy manual entry guide that, that Trevor showed you earlier. We do have the six different truancy thresholds spelled out. It depends on not only the age, but uh, grade completed. So, you know, if a student has completed sixth grade, but is not yet 17 and has 10 or more cumulative, then that's truancy incident number one. And then same thing, but only instead of 10 cumulative days, they have 10 consecutive days. That's truancy type number two. So. I won't read those out to you. Um, I, I think that's something that you're gonna have to know where to find and revert back to multiple times. Um, school board notified. In statute, it is listed last after law enforcement. Why is it required prior to parent meeting? I don't think it is required to parent meeting. I think those two, at least in a chronological order, are interchangeable. Um, I know you have to do the steps prior to those first two, 
before getting to those two, but which one you do first, I believe that's interchangeable, that you can do one before the other. The same district about the person with the question from before the one. Um, I think they're saying if a student leaves your district and returns to the same district. Um, but we, we covered that where the transfer would just remain open for that district for the year. Right. I believe Drew ran into this with Lewiston. Oh, yeah. So if the student exits and goes to another district, you ended that truancy for your district. If they come back and they re meet the, the truancy threshold again, you would open a new truancy for that student, correct? I would, let's make note to get back to this because I, yeah. I think what it actually is is you have to go in and remove that truancy end date so that it is one continuous truancy for the school year. But but Trevor may be right. We'll we'll make note to get uh, to qualify that correctly in the Q and A's on that. But if but if that's something that you need an immediate response to now, immediate answer, absolutely call the help desk. Um, and also, just to let people know, these questions we'll be bringing over to Gail when we post this webinar with the Q A's. The Q A's will have the answers we received from Gail, so you can go there to find these answers if you're looking for them. Um, as I understand, chronic is two days within a quarter, but when they hit 10, it is truancy. Um, no, chronic, absent, uh, chronic absenteeism isn't two days within a quarter. That depends on the number of quarter days you have. It's 10% of that quarter. So if you had 20 days uh, for all your students in that quarter and someone missed two, they would be considered chronically absent because that's 10%. But when we look at chronic absenteeism, when we do our counts for that, we will look at the full year, so it won't be quarter-based. So if you see a student who is in quarter two mark is chronically absent, that's just giving you a heads up that in this quarter they were, but they may not be when it comes to the end of the year. Um, as far as when they hit 10, it is a truancy. Um, the truancy guidelines um, are broken up by ages and uh, whether or not the students completed sixth grade. So it depends on the age of the student. Um, they're typically either uh, the student misses like five days in a row or seven days in a row or a cumulative of 10 days. It depends on that age. Uh, will we ever be able to end the truancy when they turn 17 via the upload? Uh, looking into that, I'm not sure of the answer, but I know that it is on uh, Synergy's radar. Uh, where we're at with that, I'm not sure, but it but it is being discussed, and I do believe that we are actively moving forward to be able to offer that capability to the users. So if I have recorded students true and they are above the age of 17, um, do I need to call the help desk in order to have them removed? Well, uh, it, it, de it depends because if, if they were meeting truancy Prior to that age, we don't want to delete that truancy incident. We simply want to go in, adjust the reported days, and then do a manual end date. So it depends if all of the, the days reported for that truancy incident occurred after they turned 17, or if they were truant, they met the definition of truant prior to their 17th birthday, but you kept adding days after their 17th birthday, then that's simply us going in and and amending that and then ending it. And by us, I mean you guys. You guys have the ability to go in and adjust those days reported and manually end that. Uh, but again, if those days were all accumulated after their 17th birthday, then that's a phone call to the help desk to have us delete that on their behalf. Um, yeah, we can. I mean, we're a little pet. So, yeah, ask the question, I'll answer. Someone just asked us, can you show an example of how to enter the truancy? Well, 
I would like to, but we don't have a test student, and I, I can't, I can't uh, do that without putting PII over the internet, personal identifiable information, and we are calling from a cell phone, um, so we're a little limited <laughs> technologically with what we if can you do. Want a good example, though, how to do it either manually or through an upload. Um, back on that Synergies Instructions page, we have a section for the truancy manual entry. You're also welcome to call the help desk. And an upload guide at the bottom of the database. Yeah. And, you can, and, and if you're more of a visual learner and the, the truancy manual upload document that has screenshot by screenshot uh, isn't conducive um, for you, then you can absolutely call the help desk and we're more than happy to, to go step by step through one or two or three of them with you until you feel like you've got your feet under you and can do that. Unfortunately, we're, we're limited technologically today, and that would be has to be something that we'd have to set up ahead of time so that we had a fake student who doesn't really exist in place so that we could show that. Yes, yeah, today was mostly mostly just be not really showing you how to do truancy. It was mostly question answers on just general policy stuff, but we don't have the uh, subject matter expert at the moment. Um, next question, what is the law uh, around contacting DHHS regarding truancy? When I contacted DHHS recently to report true students, they said that they would record the information, but that they wouldn't assign a caseworker. That's a Gail question, 100%. Um, moving on to the next one. With the many parent notifications, such as attendance and truancy letters, that occur once a student is identified while working on creating an intervention plan be documented, or while working on creating an intervention plan be documented in the truancy note until the official parent notification in the, if the intervention plan fails. What number of questions is that, Tara? I'm just going to reread this myself. Yeah. If I get you right, Cindy, and I may not not be. You're, you're asking, are you noting all the parent notifications, all the individual notifications, and whether or not those notifications have succeeded or failed? You don't have to re report down to that level. Once you've reached that step of sending an official parent notification, then you've achieved that, and that initial uh, date is what we're recording. Again, if I'm not if I'm not understanding the question correctly, Cindy, just give me a call, let me know, and uh, we'll get a better idea of it, and I can put a more comprehensive answer in the Q and A document when we release that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is touching on to a question from before. In Synergy, school board is required prior to parent meeting. So it may be. I don't because I know we changed. It's new for this year. We had changed. The chronological order, and I don't rightly have that in front of me. I don't believe because before it was step A through Z, every step had to precede the subsequent step. But we did ease up on that new for this year, so that They weren't all necessarily in chronological order, so I don't I don't have that in front of me. Um, I'm sure if Gail was here, she could answer that easily. Um, but again, when we put the Q and A out, I will get the correct answer and have it in that. Um, if we're working with students and their families with partial and non-attenders who have physical or mental health diagnosis, and we're helping them get to school but have more than 10 cumulative days of unexcused. Should we still be classifying them as true? Yeah, I mean, A, not every student has the same schedule. 
you may have uh, students um, that may have limited mobility or what have you where their individual class day differs from another student's class day as well as we don't we set up some pretty loose guidelines on what excuse and on excuse is and it's, it's up to your building administrator whether that's a principal or a superintendent to decide whether an absence is excused or not um, if that building administrator feels that that student is meeting the minimum criteria to be what they would consider in attendance then they can simply put that as excused absences um, so a lot of this boils down to um, I don't want to say local control but local determination um, so it, it really depends on a student by student basis what their schedule is and, and what what their limitations to a more generalized academic schedule is and, and whether or not local administration considers um, those absences to be excused or not. So it, it's hard to tell. It, it, it varies case by case. Um, let's take the next question. Uh, it's a little off topic and go somewhere else. Um, the, the lady said we could uh, just reply to her. Move on to the next one then. Um, couldn't have joined until now. Is this being recorded so I can see the whole thing? Yes, this will be recorded um, on the webinars page and the QA will be posted. And we will um, we'll post the QAs with the answers we received from Gail. Um, we do truancy letters that are sent home to parents and to administration for all students' truant. Should we still send these to kids over the age of 17? For state reporting purposes, no. But again, this may be something that your local administration is really committed to getting a hold of. Um, so, I mean, you, you got to be careful though in, in what wording you use when you're communicating something to the parents uh, about a kid who's not of compulsory age because by state statute, they're not required. Um, necessarily to attend. So, so for state reporting purposes, no. For local purposes, it's a local decision. Uh, next one. Hi, we have a four-year-old registered for pre-K that has been out of school since September. We were not informed by the guardian that they moved yet. We're informed by housing that they did. The phone is disconnected. And the phone is disconnected and the email is returned. We have no way to get a hold of them. They have been marked as unexcused. Do we keep this unexcused or is there anything else we can do? No, you want to end their enrollment. And uh, do we actually have an end status of not enrolled under the age of compulsory requirement or something? I don't know the exact verbiage of it, but there is, there is an exit code to end these enrollments for these very specific instances because a lot of times parents and it's not parents moving or something extenuous as, as your situation but where they just don't bother to notify their school maybe the the child just isn't quite ready for it or what have you but we do have an exit code um, and I'd strongly urge you to exit the enrollment opposed to marking absences for the student. Um, truancy manual entry guide. Scrolling down. Truancy manual entry guide link is dated May 2018. I have a copy of what appears to be the same document with the date last updated August 16, 2018. I think this doc might be from the annual August 2019 training. Just want to make sure I have the most up to date. You're going to have the most up to date probably by, if I had to guess, noon today, because in preparation for this webinar. I went in and noticed that uh, our job aids on this have not been documented since a few changes have been implemented. You are correct that the last time prior to the 17th of this month, so five days ago, um, there was last updated for the summer trainings. Um, but five days ago, we did go through this document and completely update it 
Um, so a new updated one will be linked. Uh, we'll have, we have a web guy working with uh, help desk personnel to get uh, an up-to-date copy put up on the web today. Um, like I said, hopefully by noon. Um, so do we enter the date of the initial letter to parents? Yeah, official parent notification date. Um, back to another thing, the superintendent. Um, you said there is no particular order. However, you must do them in order. Dates must be in sequence. Again, I'll, I'll point out to that. I, I'm really obviously regretting that that is the one document of the many documents I have in front of me that I don't have in front of me is, yes, yeah, some are required previous to others. Like, and I, this is this is not verbatim. Do you have something after this? You know, um, yes, but shoot. Um, this is the thing about, I'm sorry. Gail published a document, an answer to that question that is excellent and is what we should be sharing. And let me see if, I can. if you can find that yeah. and then shoot that link over to Trevor, I think yeah. that'd be because this is at least the second time it's been brought up, and we'd like to to show because it used to be step A through Z absolutely had to go in that order, and there's still some order of operation to it, but a few of the <laughs> steps are interchangeable. Yeah. It's only the beginning of the end. Right. We basically, it was four steps that you had to do in order, and we broke up steps one and two could be done either or, and then steps three and four could be done either or. They just had to be in those, in that sequence of one, two, and three, four. But um, we will get the uh, exact. I remember practicing it for um, summer training. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like you can do you can do one before two, but you gotta do one and two before three, and you can do four before three, but you gotta do one and two before four. It's, but it's much easier than that. that was yeah, I'm making it sound a lot more complicated. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we'll get that. Um, and then once we get that, um, let me just blast that link out to everyone. Next question though. Um, can we get a list of validation that are in place in synergy? Can we get a list of validations that are in place in synergy? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that would be useful for us if we could actually get that. But that's something uh, we'll have to ask synergy for. We don't know if they have the ability to just give that to us. We have the ability to give it to us. I just don't know if we have any like programmatic validations. Um, well, yeah. Um, can you specify a bit more on what kind of validations like? Things that won't let you enter uh, like a specific item in a certain field. I mean, if it's along those lines, then it's spelled out in our data dictionary. Uh, yeah, we'll see. But I don't know. I'm not 100% privy to the validations on manual entry. I would assume that they somewhat correlate. Um, okay. How are you able to change the number of required hours for a student who has medical slash other issues documented? For example, three hours instead of five. She asking is the person asking how to how to change the number of required hours for a student? Um, is this like in regards to um, whether or not the student's considered absent on a day? Yeah. About how do you put an alternate schedule in for the student? You don't enter those. Um, they do in their DISs. Oh, not in our. Yeah. So there, there should be some place in your um, student in your local student information system that allows you to set the schedule for the student. Um, your local data specialist person should be able to help you with that. I don't know exactly where it lives, but um, it assumes a full school day for most people unless there's something else, and then it just prorates. When they're out so if, then if you put them out for half a day it would be three hours instead of right. four and a half or something like that so it's in your local system somewhere um but i, I don't have more specifics than that i do don't hear it say i assume that it's in your scheduling module within your local dis to set up you know what what constitutes a full day for each student Um, 
got that answer. Where is it? Can you show me where it is? Um, so it's in the, it's actually in our PowerPoint. That's what she used on the training. So that's what I was going to direct you to. Yeah, it's right here. Top of the floor. Okay. Can you just highlight that, paste it into a new email, and send it to them? Yeah. You can send that to everyone. We're going to blast it on your screen. Okay. But we'll also add it to the answer. Yeah. Um, so as well as a link as to where to find that. Two yeah. Question after the um, number of required hours. Um, can we go back to the date of the last day of them being in school? Can we go back to the date of the day last day of them being in school? I think I know what you're saying. In other words, whoever was recording the absences wasn't privy to the student moving on for whatever reason. It's a little ambiguous question, but if I, I think I'm getting you right, is that you want to be able to backdate the end date maybe, but you can do that. You have to do it manually, I believe, but you can do it. We have a student that has moved out of town and is no longer with us. She's in sixth grade and is being marked absent each day. Are you saying we should exit them as moved out of district versus marking them absent every day? Um, if you know where that student went and you got a request for records from someone, you can transfer them out accordingly based on that request for records. But if you don't know the student is actually no longer in your town or moved out, you would have to keep that true and be open. Right, so it's a little bit different than the 4YL we were talking about because you know, if this individual is in six or has completed six, they they very well could be falling under one of these truancy types. So if they do meet the criteria for one of the truancy types, then you have to keep them enrolled until you have done your due diligence through the truancy type, which should take you to the end of the year. Um, and I, it's unfortunate, I, I understand that. I would do my best to try to get a hold of the student's parents and because even if you don't get an official request for records from another school district, from a public or private school in state or out of state, if you can get a letter of intent from the parents saying we're moving to Florida or, or what have you, th that will suffice um, to, to, to allow you to go in and, and exit that student accordingly. Follow up on the previous question. Um, and I think the previous question was the uh, number of required hours. Mm -hmm. um, if we know a student has moved out of state but do not have formal documentation, um, we are able to end the truth and withdraw them. Yeah. I mean, able, yes. Is it the correct way to report that to the state? No. And if you if you know they left state, um, I would assume you may know which school they went to. I would just get in contact with the school and ask for just like some documentation saying that they have your student, and then you can then go ahead and exit it. So if it ever comes up in the future where the state's saying why did the kid leave state, you'll have documentation saying he went here. We have even had uh, school districts who had a neighbor said, "Oh yeah, they moved to Illinois," and then that school district contacted the State Department of Education for Illinois and say, you know, this is the information, this is the student we believe has moved into your state, and all we need you to do is send us an email saying, yes, this student enrolled in one of our schools as of whatever date, we'll take that. I mean, if you're willing to go to that, that painstaking step, um, but unless you've got something in documentation, that's somewhat solid, then you have to keep that student on your rolls. And it's for the best of the student because we really are trying to do our best to make sure that we know where all the students are. So, you know, just in case there's something, an at-risk at situation or something. What if, uh, what if the student is truant? We have gone through all the steps. Letters and phone calls with no response from the student. The student is over 17. Can we withdraw them from school? Um, if it if the student wasn't 17 at the start of the year, 
um, and they turn 17 halfway through the year, um, you would still keep that truancy open just till the end of the school year. But at the end of the school year, it will exit it with the student. And when he comes back in the following year, you won't need to take out another one for him. Right. Keep in mind that if a student is 18 or older and they want to write a note saying, I'm leaving school, then you can put discontinued schooling as an exit code. If their parent or legal guardian does that, if they're 17 or older, then you can discontinue schooling them. Those are the only two instances. So a, a district cannot discontinue schooling a student who's of compulsory age or even above compulsory age without notification from either the student at 18 or higher or the parent guardian at 17 and higher. Where's the list of steps to take when trying to resolve a truancy? Um, I think that's what I think Kathy has been sending over to me. Okay. I hate Can you stop sharing your screen and open it up? Yeah. And then start sharing your screen again. I tried to send it to you, but it's too long. I can search it up if you want. Is that easy? No, I am not following me now. Stop okay. sharing my screen anymore. Uh, I can see. This is what I'm saying. That's what's in that um, thing is what's in the PowerPoint. I think it was extra in there. Oh, I didn't, I didn't download the file. Well, what we're looking for is in the body of the email. Okay, yeah. so the name of the email. So, so I'm going to share my screen real quick with this email on it. Um, so these are the, uh, the orders for the currency steps. Okay, sorry. It looks like there's a whole missing line after that first bullet. No, I think the first bullet is just off. Okay, so can you open this up so it's bigger? And then zoom in on that, control, scroll. Okay, so the, here are the, the steps. Does it say which ones have to be done in which order? I mean, yeah, they're the official steps, but they're not saying. Is two is slide two twenty four from my presentation? Yeah. See if you can't open up that slide two twenty four. It doesn't have. Can you, are you pausing your screen right now? Can you go to P Drive Help Desk? Go to. Um, 2020 changes. And there should be a document from Charlotte. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's in the PowerPoint. So if you go back to the screen before it in the PowerPoint. Here, it's in the. If you go to the PowerPoint screen, um, 222 explains the changes that we were talking about. Yes. 
actually. We're not muted. <laughs> Um, sorry, guys, I'm trying to find the specific answer to this question. So, um, well, I know how much screen shared off, so you may be able to see that. So, um, truancy should be uh, followed in statutory order, but entry sequence rules have been relaxed. So, um, this is set up so we have to do steps one and two, then steps three or four, and then step five or six. The most important part of this, as I recall, is this part about move on to step three when best efforts have failed to yield the results. So you don't actually have to have accomplished um, the intervention plan, or you can be accomplishing the intervention plan and move on to the other part. Um, so Superintendent notification, parent notification, school board notification, and official parent meeting are optional to be put into the record. You still have to gather what the dates for those are, but the required steps in order are intervention plan, referral to law enforcement, and then any additional interventions. Um, so, moving on to the next question, uh, the synergy validation question on the upload, what field validations are in place? Uh, so, she wants to know what field validations are in place. This goes back to the order of operations question. So, yeah. Um, I would suggest reviewing the information from the summer PowerPoint because that talks about what the statutory requirements are in the best detail. Um, Another question, we have, uh, uh, we have a ninth grade student who told us they were moving to Florida. This was two weeks ago. We have not received any re records requests yet. I have tried reaching out to the mother, but no avail. He's being marked as unexcused. We do not know the city slash town they live in in Florida. Sorry. So they, they have a student, a ninth grade student, who moved to Florida, said they were moving to Florida two weeks ago. Um, they are trying to reach out to the mother, no avail, and now they are being marked as unexcused and they don't know which town or city the student went to in Florida. Unless they get something in writing, that kid stays enrolled until the end of school year. Yeah, until, at least until the end of the year, the student is enrolled unless we have documentation saying he's enrolled. So, um, oh, we have Gail. <laughs> so Gail was able to join us. The education I, committee has well, sent her in our direction. We're <laughs> glad for that. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so the what I have um, typically advised schools is that if they have verification from the parent that the move has taken place, and they and they they have documentation that the move has taken place, they would not have to wait till they get a records request from out of state because once a child is living in a different state, it's that state's responsibility to um, to uphold whatever their truancy laws are and not ours. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Oh, oh, wait, was so you're saying um, So I can't speak to the to the um, exiting, but in terms of truancy if there's verification that the student is no longer living in the right. state of well, Maine, we'll it is right. 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 That's right. what we're asking for. If we right. get the verification, they can go ahead and exit it, and right. the truancy ends too. Right. So but if we um, don't we, officially know. Yeah, they don't have that ver official verification, either a press record or a letter from the parents saying they went somewhere else. Right. Like just the kids saying, I'm going for it in a couple of right. weeks isn't enough. So a parent, a parent doing withdrawal and saying, we're moving right. out of state. Yeah. Fine. Um, so they yeah. should be. So in they that tried, case, they, so they tried reaching out. Oh, okay, and got nothing from mom. Okay. So they tried reaching out to the mother, no avail. They don't know which city or town they're moving to. So it's either if they like we were going to say request records, they don't know the town though, and the school didn't ask for that kid's records, which is kind of strange in the first place because school should ask for the records of the student. But if you didn't get that, yeah, you did the best that was trying to reach the parent. Cause, uh, How long has it been? Two weeks. 
Um, it is also possible for schools to reach out to the board, to the State Department of Education in a state where they believe a student has moved and request help in locating a student. Okay. And, and Florida has helped me um, in that in situations like that. Before. Okay. So that yeah. would be the next best step to take yeah. is kind of contact there and figure out where that student is. Yeah. Right. And I'm happy to help with that if people get yeah. stuck. So Gail's also available to talk about that situation um, individually if you want to reach out to Gail. Um, I have a student who enrolled at my school and then moved to another town. Um, we have confirmed that he has moved to another town, but he is not enrolled at that school. Can I exit him or do I need to count? He said. Um, so he confirmed to be in another town. Um, I assume it's documented somewhere that he went to another town. Um, I would He's confirmed to be there. So th they either got the records request or but they, the other school hasn't done the enrollment yet. Great. So if you got a record request from that other school and that other school hasn't enrolled the kid, you can act with the kid and you would have to contact that school telling them to enroll that kid because he's now theirs. Um, but if a student just went to another town, he told you he's going to another town, um, and they just show up somewhere, they just stop coming, but no other school picks them up, um, you just have to keep them enrolled to the end of the year unless another school says we're taking your students. That may be a situation too where you want to have an internal conversation about how to escalate those kind of requests. Like if, if the secretary at the other school isn't cooperating or the data specialist or something like that, um, maybe the principal could give a call, maybe the superintendent could give a call. You, you should try and see if there's some sort of escalation procedure that might help. Because um, just tracking them down is really the goal. <laughs> Um, can a parent withdraw a student who is younger than 17 from a district without any plans for enrolling in a different school? There, there are some provisions that, that do, in exceptional cases, allow parents to withdraw students over 15 um, or who have completed ninth grade. Um, but it's not just a simple process of the parent doing the withdrawal. There has to be an agreement with the school system, um, including the school board, with a plan in place for um, for some continuing education or work, and with a meeting scheduled annually until the child turns 17, so that the school and the parents um, are agreeing to keep track on the educational needs of the child. Yeah. So you can't. Withdraw, um, yeah, you can't withdraw the students, or parents can withdraw students who are under 17 unless they meet those specific exceptions. And the first step of that exception is the student has to be 16 at least, or at least 15 or older. So you shouldn't be seeing any elementary or any compulsory age students in elementary school or middle school getting withdrawn by their parents. Unless they're enrolling someplace. Unless the they're moving to another district. Or, or homeschooling, right? Right. That may also be another situation where Gail's personal perspective on your individual situation might come in handy. Sure. <laughs> Can I have a records request for a student who was uh, who had moved out of state but never received a request for their younger sibling? And I use the same end date for the sibling as the high school student. We have confirmed that the sheriff's office of the family moved out of the local residence. The family documented um, uh, had only the mother was the guardian. And this is an out-of-state move? Yep. So they did get a request for records. For one of the students. For one of them. And they're sure that the, and they've confirmed that the other children they moved with the family. family. Oh. Did they call the other school? Um, no, actually, that's, yeah, that would probably be the, the best step is to, you have the request for records from that school, is to contact that school real quick and just ask them, do you have the student sibling in your district? Or can you give me the contact information for the grade range, the appropriate school for those siblings? Yeah. Just try to see if you can locate those students. Um, and if you do, perfectly offset. Um, if you can't, or if the school says they're not there, then I would, you should keep the students enrolled. Or if the school says they don't know, um, then you can contact us and we can try to figure out where that student is. Um, last question. 
question at the moment, back to my question about four-year-olds and pre-K students, if we unenroll them, uh, can we go all the way back to the last day she was here or unenroll her as of today? So, um, yeah, if the student left last, like two weeks ago, we can ask for them now um, for two weeks ago. The only time we uh, don't want schools to go too far back is uh, if the, oh, no, September? Yeah, we can ask this. Um, you would actually have to, ask, yeah, so that was the one exception we we're getting to is. Um, once we're past October 1st, where subsidy was given for the students who are enrolled, um, you can't act for the students before 10 1 if they were enrolled before 10 1 because that student received subsidy. So you have to keep that student enrolled at least until 10 1 or 10 2 to accurately show that the student received subsidy. Now, when I came in here, were you talking about approved compulsory age dropouts? Yes. Okay. Did we show them where they can go get guidance on our website? No, we mentioned the guidance. So if we go back to um, the help desk page, and I believe it's under the student enrollment guide aisle. That's incorrect or outdated. Let us know. We'll update it. Are you on that pile? Okay, this is the very last one on that pile. That's perfect. Okay. And so that is current, still up to date. Mm -hmm. So here is um, where you get, this is the guidelines you mentioned earlier, to um, the exceptions for students who are 15 and 16 to be withdrawn by their parents. If they meet all these requirements here, um, you can go ahead and, uh, yes, you'll have to inform the help desk, um, and we will uh, we'll go ahead and exit that kid accordingly. Um, got another question. Um, enrollment date. If a student transfers out before we upload all the truancy information, we get an error. End date is required due to inactive enrollment, but end date is no not part of the upload file any longer. Is there an upload? Is there an error in the validation or in the upload file? Um, either way, this will be corrected soon. Uh, will this be corrected soon so that we can upload truancy for a student that transferred out? Yes. Right now, you have to do it manually. We are trying to get it. So that they can do it via upload. And if we have a phone call with EdgePoint slash truancy tomorrow in which we're addressing this. So that was the, at the moment that was the last question. So um we'll give it a couple more minutes if you guys have any uh other last second questions. Um just now. Please keep in mind we are losing our room in about seven minutes. <laughs>
Okay, everyone. So questions are slowing down, people are dropping out. So we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, again, you can find this webinar. We post on the webinar the presentation tile for the help desk webpage, and all the questions and answers will be posted there. And we will get answers for all the questions up there, as well as the ones we uh, that we'll get in touch with via on. So you can expect to find all those there. But with that, thank you everyone for coming.